Google, Microsoft. Feels like there's something missing. Oh, should I should I <laughs> leave the chair for the other provider? This 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 is other cloud, right? <laughs> yeah. What what's the deal with that? Why are they? Well, I'm saving them a seat. <laughs> So, somebody from AWS here yeah. who wants to come up and yeah. anybody here from AWS? We anybody? welcome you up here. Anybody with an AWS account? <laughs> <laughs> Devin, you've got Prime membership, right? All right, All you right. qualify. You qualify. So, uh, thanks for being here, guys. Um, yep. Why don't you just briefly introduce yourself and tell us what you do in the context of Cloud Foundry. Right. Uh, my name is K.Y. Srinivasan. I run the Enterprise Open Source Group at Microsoft. Uh, we do a bunch of upstream projects, one of which obviously is Cloud Foundry. Uh, my team is also responsible for making sure that Linux runs well on various uh, Microsoft platforms, including Azure. Given that a lot of the open source projects are born on Linux, the work that we do in making Linux run well on Hyper-V is a foundational piece for projects such as Cloud Foundry to run well on, on our platforms. I'm uh, Eric Johnson. I lead an engineering team working on open source integrations for Google Cloud Platform. And we've been working in the Cloud Foundry community for probably over a year now, I'd say. Hey, I'm Chip Childers. My job is to run over in my keynote. <laughs> and, and he drives Uber doing a spare no, just. <laughs> uh, so we're here to talk about multi-cloud. And I'm really interested in what you are doing to help your customers Make that, uh, make that progression to multi-cloud. Right. Uh, <clears throat> multi-cloud means different things to different people, right? Well, one is the ability to deploy workloads on different clouds, different public clouds. And Cloud Foundry is a wonderful uh, mechanism to make that happen. Uh, we support Cloud Foundry. And the, the goal there is to make sure that we don't deviate in our implementation of Cloud Foundry so that workloads that are deployed on Azure could just move over and run elsewhere as well. Uh, and for somebody like Microsoft that actually has had a long history with enterprise uh, customers, uh, multi-cloud also means hybrid cloud, uh, meaning uh, we want to bridge the gap between on-prem cloud infrastructures um, to public cloud uh, infrastructures. So we do have offerings uh, on the on-prem side, like the Azure stack. So we have uh, Cloud Foundry enabled on Azure Stack as well. So uh, the entire spectrum uh, of uh, both private clouds as well as public clouds is addressed in our multi-cloud strategy. Once Azure Stack is actually available to everybody. Well, we've had previews of it going out. Uh, sometime this year it will be available. Um, sure. Eric, what's your definition of multi-cloud? Yeah, I think it's a... Uh... You know, obviously, it's about customer choice, right? Um, I think that Cloud Foundry uh, is a great way to abstract a lot of the differences from cloud providers. Uh, what I think is also very important in the Cloud Foundry ecosystem is that you still have the capability to utilize platform differentiators uh, through the open service broker API and service broker model. Um, but you're still uh, abstracting away a lot of the complexities that you probably don't necessarily care about, right? Uh, so you could have foundations running on Azure or Amazon or Google and still take advantage of platform differentiators. Yeah, yeah I think it's an interesting buzzword. <laughs> um, but but in, in all honesty, I, th I think it represents um, w what's a hard reality of, of true enterprise, right? Um, but we can, we can use whatever word we want to use because it used to be hybrid cloud and then, there was, you know, then we had this cloud bursting thing which turns out isn't really a thing and now we're talking about multi-cloud. But what it actually means is that there's, there's, enterprise environments are complicated, right? You're, you're gonna wanna place your applications in, um, in public clouds if that makes the most sense. You're gonna wanna do it in uh, hopefully agile local infrastructure when that makes sense, right? And I think it's just more of a, a way to step back and accept complexity, right. in, in particular geographic and location complexity, and then, and then service variance you know, between those environments. Is that something you're actually seeing your customers do? Yes, uh, the cloud journey has started, and we need to make sure that we bring along everybody that uh, had a significant investment in their legacy application stacks and infrastructure. So that's the, 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 the intention to bring our existing customers over uh, to the cloud. And Azure Stack, as I mentioned earlier, we feel is a bridge to that journey. And the new, you know, born in the cloud customers, uh, they want choice, they want choice. And Microsoft 
uh, is all about choice these days. And, and Microsoft also uh, traditionally has made the complex symbol. Now, my grandmother could, could read email because of Microsoft <laughs> offerings, <laughs> <laughs> right? So uh, the, the, that, that simplicity is what Cloud Foundry offers, uh, being able to deploy uh, workloads, complex workloads uh, on different infrastructures. Yeah, we've definitely worked on, on architectures with customers uh, that have an on-premise Cloud Foundry, and they're looking at expanding out into the cloud, right? So as they start to uh, you know, feel much more comfortable moving to public cloud, they don't want to continue to make investments <laughs> in data center capacity. Uh, they're looking at how do they continue to use Cloud Foundry, where they're already using that on-prem, and then start using uh, cloud, right? So Cloud Foundry, again, allows them to bridge that gap and uh, we've you know, been working on architectures that uh, take advantage of a lot of like Google's infrastructure, uh, how we service you know, Gmail and YouTube and stuff like that, making that available to Cloud Foundry users. Yeah. I, I think there's gonna be some interesting use cases coming up in, in keynotes later in the conference. Um, talking about you know, the use of different public cloud providers. Um, I mean, you know, frequently we talk about, uh, you know, your, our first thought is this, first you start private, then you kind of go public. Um, but public cloud adoption's already reached the stage where now we're starting to say, I'm using more than one, right? I'm gonna use Microsoft for some, I'm gonna use Google for others, and I'm still gonna possibly have an on-prem OpenStack deployment or vSphere or VMware Photon deployment. And I think that's, you know, that we're gonna increasingly see that. The other thing we seem to be seeing more is people starting out in the cloud and then going private because it's sometimes cheaper for them sure. to do that too. Yeah, right? I mean the biggest lie you can tell yourself is that public cloud is a, a, a cost reduction. Right. I mean it's just not true. Um, it's not. Oh, you are? I thought it was. I don't know. I don't if, know. If, if you have a spreadsheet that proves it, I'd love it. I think I've got a mark. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but, but in, it, it, it's about agility. It's not about. Um, you know, operational, I mean, total cost of ownership is gonna be lower, yes, but, but you're, gonna spend, you're gonna spend money for, for each thing that you're using, and you all are gonna fight it out on price and quality, and you know, there's a, there's a way to kind of measure that, but, but it is, in many ways, more expensive than going to buy one server and then amortizing that over however many years, right? Right. But you have to buy that server and wait for the truck to show up with it. So I think the, uh, the other advantage, I think, you know, standardizing on Cloud Foundry, it's not just about technology or abstracting away the infrastructure, it's also the expertise of the team. Uh, you know, you've got the new developer program out there that uh, just launched recently, right? So you have developers that are learning how to use, effectively, many different clouds with a single abstraction. Yeah, we, we, we hope that that's powerful. <laughs> <laughs> when, when they're making their choice, though, which clouds to use, there is something, uh, let's call it service gravity, right? If I'm using already a right. bunch of Microsoft or Google or AWS services, I probably want to be close to those, mm -hmm. right? Do you see that as an advantage, as a disadvantage for you? Right, right. so we talked about how Cloud Foundry uh, kind of abstracts the platforms and gives a uniform runtime for applications. But applications don't run in isolation, right? They, they need to consume services, and Microsoft has a rich set of service offerings uh, that have been used by enterprise customers for quite some time. So we believe the, you know, the cloud choice uh, often is made uh, not just on the price and uh, other tangible uh, differentiators, but also what is the ecosystem, right? And how closely does that ecosystem match with what they're already used to uh, in their uh, on-prem world. So yes, uh, I do believe that uh, the, the ecosystem uh, has a, a great bearing on the choice. Sure. Now, most people don't run Google on-prem, so it's... Uh, no, not, not too much. <laughs> that would be cool, though. Do you have a product announcement you want to make? No. Okay. <laughs> GCP stack, it's coming. Yeah. In a Docker image. <laughs> <laughs> In a container. Yeah. Big, very big container. Big container. Yeah. Um, my question. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, given that, mo uh, do you, you can tell we rehearsed, right? Do you see that as a disadvantage for you? At, at no, I don't think so. I think, um, you know, again with the Cloud Foundry, right? You can run that anywhere. So yes, uh, service gravity, right, would, is probably something that uh, you know you would want to take advantage of. So if you're using an Azure right. service or a GCP service, you definitely have a foundation uh, nearby, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't 
it doesn't still require that you're just locked in on a single yes. provider, right? Um, it just may be for those sets of applications, you would do your application deployments in that particular foundation that utilizes those services, um, but you could just as easily use Spanner where you've got some maybe vendor lock-in with GCP and you've got a foundation there. Uh, again, your developers are being able to do CF push to applications depending on where they need access to those services sure. if service gravity is important to them. So, so I've actually got a question for, for both, both of you. Um, both of your organizations have had a pretty interesting relationship with open source in, in the past. Right? Um, but but you're, you're increasing the engagement in, in these communities, I mean, at, at a really high velocity, right? Both of you. It's an yeah. amazing work. Um, so can you just tell us a little bit more about what that means to, you know, what that means to Google, what that means to Microsoft, and, and you know, and, and, and your customers? Right. I think, um, so I'll jump in first on this one. Uh, I think for um, Google, right, I mean, all of Google is built on top of open source, mm -hmm. right? Every server that we have runs Linux. Uh, every developer workstation runs some form of Unix, whether that's even Mac, right? And it's basically Unix under the hood. Every engineer at Google knows how to use SED and Grab and all of these things, right? It's all open source, has been since day one. Um, and we care a lot about making sure that we're giving back to that community, right? So, you know, obviously some of the contributions that we've made, um, you know, C groups back to enable containers in the first place, uh, from Android operating system, right? All of this stuff is Linux based. Um, you know, participating in standards bodies, all of those things uh, are incredibly important to Google's business. Okay. Well, the uh, <clears throat> so Microsoft's journey into open source um, has been more recent. Mm -hmm. And again, it's really based on choice. And we, we see customers asking us to uh, support them in the choices they've made. Right, if somebody wants to run an open source stack as part of their application, as part of their workload, we want to make sure that our platform can support it as best as we can. Yeah. Right? And we also see value in the open source development model. The tooling that's there, for, for instance, just about a couple of months ago, all of the Windows kernel development moved from our own proprietary repos to use Git. We saw that you know, uh, Git was a, a better tool for managing source. And so we moved 25, 30 years of history back from our repos to, to Git. So we, we participate in, in open source uh, projects in one of three different ways. Right? One is we participate in a large project. We contribute to that. Mm -hmm. Cloud Foundry is one of that. Linux kernel is, is another example of that. We also are the owners of some open source projects, .NET for instance. We open source that and uh, we are the main maintainers of that project. And lastly, we use open source tools internally to make our own development more agile. So for us, open source has been, uh, you know, has brought us back to our core developer focused uh, company that we were to begin with, right? So this is a different way of doing things and certainly is uh, something that um, you know, people uh, are very happy about. In fact, within Microsoft, there are about 15,000 GitHub accounts. You know, uh, people are just developing uh, software and using open source software to build products within Microsoft. Yeah. I, I particularly like the, uh, the, the point you made there about um, uh, the, the, the focus on the, really the developer experience right. and, and taking some of the, you know, the open source approach to software engineering. Right. Um, and, and that honestly, it's it's not free as in free software, right? It's I mean we're we're all doing this to to affect outcomes, right? Um, and, and in the case of you know the end user organizations here, it's to affect outcomes for their business that might have nothing to do with technology, but it's enabling it. Um, and in, you know in the case of technology vendors, it's of course it's to service your customers um, and, and make sure that they have what they need. So that's great. Well, well, Chip goes totally off topic here right now. Let's bring it back to Cloud yeah, Foundry like for a moment. Um, <laughs> What, what is it you're actually doing? Between, you talked about the developer experience. Is it, what are you actually doing to enhance the developer experience for Cloud Foundry developers? Well, the, the, the support of Cloud Foundry on Azure, we expect it to be second to none, meaning you know, it's, it's going to be a, a first-rate experience for people that want to, to develop uh, Cloud Foundry-based workload for Azure. And that says it all, really. Yeah, nothing specific, but... Uh, we make sure that all of the, the, the most uh, up-to-date Cloud Foundry bits are supported on Azure. I think uh, 
I guess I would say same thing, right? Same goal, right? We want to be sort of the best public cloud provider, right? right? Uh, some of the things that we're done to try and differentiate ourselves is, you know, utilizing a lot of Google's infrastructure innovations. Uh, you know, our global load balancers, right? Uh, single IP address all over the planet. Route you to the closest foundation. You don't have to do any setup. Uh, other things like um, wiring in your logging and monitoring, right? So you're you're taking all of your application and operator logs and putting that into our stack driver logging tool. Uh, you can tie into a, like our debugger. Uh, so that's in, um, we're putting agents into the build packs for that. So you can actually live debug your applications that are running on top of Cloud Foundry on GCP. So just trying to make uh, those innovations available to Cloud Foundry users on GCP. Do those, once I do that though, once I've built all those monitoring tools into my processes, I'm not that likely to move away from, from your cloud, am I? You could. I, I could, right? but it seems like a lot more work. Um, I think that goes back to your topic about you know, right. um, service sort of gravity, right? Um, but there's nothing that would preclude you from being able to do that. And even, uh, you know, we have customers that are using that today on-prem. Right. They're still ingesting their logs into Stackdriver. Um, and they're doing that from on-prem Cloud Foundry Foundation. So that, that's also an area where we have tried to add value to the Cloud, you know, Cloud Foundry infrastructure. Uh, we do have a fairly extensive uh, log analytics that's backed by machine learning and AI and all that. So we have plugged that infrastructure with Cloud Foundry so that we can actually reason about the logs and give some recommendations to Cloud Foundry users on our platforms. What about if, when you're seeing people move to, to multi-cloud setups, what are the, some of the mistakes they make that maybe the people in the audience here can avoid and learn from you? Uh, not using Cloud Foundry patterns, perhaps. <laughs> Good man, I'll give you the thought later. <laughs> That's it? You well, you know, as long as they restrict themselves to uh, the, the best practices as laid out um, in the Cloud Foundry patterns, uh, I think they'll be in a good shape. Yeah, I think it's, it's really, I think that the, the best thing that you could do to take advantage of multi-cloud is to use something like Cloud Foundry, right? Um, Go after the things that you care about on the platform, but otherwise the rest of the stuff you just kind of abstract away so that you don't really have to learn all of those idiosyncrasies. You know, every, every you know, major cloud provider has a virtual machine as a service, but they're all a little bit different. And why would you want to have to go through and remember like these parameters for this or these parameters for that? You just let Bosch take care of that for you. Uh, and then just focus on developing your applications. That's the best multi-cloud strategy, I think. That's, I'm sure Chip will agree with that. So. I, absolutely. <laughs> I, I have nothing to add. They did a great job. I'll be paying I, them later. Oh, I, later. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, you're not seeing any, anybody just screwing up, though, in, in their setups? I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> well, I mean, let, Frederick, it, let's be honest. It, it is hard to make these architectural choices, right? Yeah. Um, but, but it's not any different, really. Um, you, you've got the same set of criteria in your thought process around you know, availability, resiliency, um, you know, where, how you're going to store your data, how you're going to ensure it. Um, all of those same things that we used to think about when, when we were racking and stacking you know, the, uh, the hardware in our own closets um, and calling it a data center. Right? It's all of those same problems that you have to think about. Um, when, when you start spanning across multiple clouds, the the complexity doesn't go away, but you have more tools available to you mm -hmm. to, to solve those problems, right? And you can rely more on the service providers. So for example, you, know, you need to back up your data, right? You, know, we, you should probably just use the native service for backing it up for the various clouds you know, that your, your infrastructure's on, right? Because that's, that's not a value added thing that even your platform operations group should be focused on. Right. What? What's looking ahead a little bit? What, what is still needed? What, what do you still want to, to build into the platform to enable easier multi-cloud deployments, for example? Mm. Is that something you're thinking about? Um, what I'm seeing is the platforms are evolving and raising the bar. Uh, a lot of things that Bosch did, for instance, are going to be part of the underlying platform moving forward. Mm -hmm. And that journey is going to continue. You know, the platform is going to do more and more things to, uh, with regards to availability and scaling and load balancing and all that. And so while it might have made sense in the past to have that 
at the value add on top of the platform. We need to figure out a way where we can have a flexible way of uh, leveraging what the platform has to offer mm -hmm. uh, in building this higher level orchestration engines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if, if all the cloud providers could just synchronize your release schedules, um, <laughs> that would be really helpful because then the abstractions would, would evolve together. Uh, but, but I think, I mean, the, 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 the point here. The, the points where you interface with the platform yeah. have to allow yes. for that uh, journey to occur at our pace, right? We all are not going to do the same thing at the same time. Right. But we should be able to say, OK, if this platform provides it, let's yeah. use it. If not, we'll build up something that, that does it. I think I uh, had an interesting conversation last night with Dimitri uh, about this, talking about how Bosch, um, the way that I look at it uh, today, like if you're setting up Cloud Foundry on top of any provider, there's a certain set of infrastructure you need to create. Bosch takes care of disks and VMs for you, but uh, there, it leaves other things left as out of band. Um, you know, I could see a kind of a future where Bosch is starting to do a lot of that extra stuff for you, um, and then making that even easier to abstract away some of the platform differences where uh, Bosch is handling a lot more. Not that he signed up for any of that, I should say, right? It was just a conversation. Yeah. But that's why we're here. Yeah. To have great conversations about great conversations, yes. Yeah. And, and that wraps up the great conversation. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for right. the panel. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. All right, thanks, Jeff. Thanks.